Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture guide number nine uh, on the arts. This is our first foray into the Baroque period of art in Western Europe. Um, honestly, we could spend probably the entire quarter on Baroque arts, but uh, of course, we can't do that. So I'm going to give you today a fairly long lecture and a lot of examples of art of this period, um, but I'm going to focus in on some key ones and spend more time on those so as to not overwhelm you. I want to start with the context a little bit here before we go into Caravaggio's work. <clears throat> the Baroque period uh, is the first kind of international period of art in Western Europe, meaning that a lot of these artists are traveling from country to country, showing their stuff. People are becoming aware of art from all over and collecting that art. Um, but for Italy, which is where we're starting and then going on into Spain, where things are very similar, um, the big thing going on in the context is the these are all Catholic nations. Um, and remember, we were talking about Protestantism last week in the northern areas. Um, in Italy and in Spain, being Catholic, the big thing going on in the context is what's known as the Counter-Reformation, meaning the Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation. And um, not surprising, uh, in order to bring people back into the fold, in order to inspire devotion, in order to, frankly, get people on the side of the Catholics rather than the Protestants, the Catholics adopt a number of strategies that are very similar to the type of work that you've seen in the Northern Renaissance in some ways. Um, first of all, uh, the art that you'll be seeing over and again in Italy is meant to inspire people through using very theatrical emotionality, right? They're meant to, unlike the classical period of the Renaissance, these works of art are meant to be very theatrical, meant to um, tug on your emotional heart strings um, and, uh, and in order to kind of inspire your devotion in their topics and to get you interested in the subjects. Um, number two, it's as if we're returning back to Giano in a way. Um, the art of this period, especially in Italy, can be fairly didactic, meaning it's meant to teach you about things. A lot of the artworks that you see in the Baroque period were absolutely pitched to kind of um, what we would think today as everyday people, uh, both of the lower and the middle class by today's standards. Uh, and so these things stand in, these works of art stand in for biblical texts in a lot of ways. If we look at the idealistics of this period, it will allow me to go into greater depth about these things. Um, I have noticed in a number of your essays that style hasn't shown up with as much frequency as I'd like, or that you haven't gone into as much detail about the style as I would like. Remember, the style is a kind of generalized idea. We're talking about period style here, a generalized set of characteristics that we expect to find in art of a particular time period within a particular cultural realm or, uh, you know, country. And the reason this is important is that it can help us to see the things that we should be looking out for in works of art. Uh, and really analyzing the formal elements of the art, right? The way that line and color and shape and composition and particular uses of perspective or particular subjects, um, the way that these things can um, basically modify a general subject matter. We've been talking about this all the way through, but keep that in mind that the stories keep getting told. You've seen a million enunciations by this time, a number of crucifixions, but they get told quite differently. And the way that they're told differently is through the way that the artist chooses to employ the formal elements of art. So in the Baroque period, some of the stylistics we associate with this period, and it doesn't matter what country you're in, are things like number one, an interest in naturalism, often seen as synonymous with truth or believability. Naturalism is believable figures in believable spaces so as to make you think, yes, this could have really happened, even if it isn't an accurate or a realistic representation. 
And it's not surprising that this interest in naturalism also coincides with a general interest in, in culture at this time with the empirical sciences, sciences that are about observation and testing hypotheses and so forth. Um, and of course, you want to shy away from idealism, which is associated with conceptualism, and focus on naturalism, which is much more closely associated with observation or empiricism. Number two, a, an analytic approach to and careful reinterpretation of classicism. This is a little bit tougher to explain in the abstract, so I'll pick this up as we see it in works of art, um, but it's something we saw in mannerism where you saw, for instance, Pontormo or Parmigianino quoting Michelangelo's Pietà. Uh, and the Baroque artists do this a lot. It's like, you know, embedding a quote in an essay or something of that sort. So as to show people that you know this earlier art form, but you're doing something different or just to say, hey, remember about this other art form or this other work of art that you have seen before. I'm working on the same thematics as that. It's not surprising as well that within the context, <clears throat> the wider context of this period, there's a rise in archaeological investigation. Archaeology or the study of past ages becomes a part of what is a kind of key component of the historical context, which is, which is the rise of what's known as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is kind of the, the, it's like humanism on steroids in a way. It's rationalizing humanism even further. It's trying to codify knowledges so that we know as much as we can about every single subject in the world, including past ages. The Number three and number four are very closely tied together and they have to do with the theatricality of the Baroque period. Um, number three, Baroque artists tend to be very interested in human emotion, even psychology. So you'll see a lot of very emotive pictures that are meant to inspire your devotion. They're meant to kind of, you know, <clears throat> catch you up in their emotionality. And then number four, Whereas in the Renaissance, as we said, the Renaissance artists conceived of their paintings as a window onto another more perfect world. Uh, and in that situation, you're kind of separated from the scene that you're witnessing as if there's a pane of glass between you and that scene. You're a kind of silent voyeur. Uh, in the Baroque period, something quite different occurs very frequently where the artist attempts to include you in the scene in one way or another, have things kind of break the picture plane of the painting or sculptures that are meant to be walked around, uh, things that will, um, you know, make your bodily experience important to the work of art. And that can oftentimes be a, a very good way to heighten the emotion or the psychology of works of art. See these things in operation. I start us here just very briefly with a Caravaggio work. It's a very fairly easy work. Caravaggio or Michelangelo Morisi, which is his, his given name, uh, was an artist who was born in the north of Italy, but very quickly moved to Rome uh, for the vast majority of his career. And he's without question the most important Italian Baroque artist of his time period, meaning that the things that he does in his art uh, oftentimes got taken up by other artists later uh, on and used over and over and over again. That's his, his impact on the history of art. Um, when he went to Rome, he worked in a larger workshop where for the most part he was um, painting scenes of flowers and of fruit and of landscape and so forth to accompany the figures that were in those works of art. And then he struck out on his own and without, you know, within a couple of years of being in Rome, he was the most sought after artist in Rome. He has a very interesting career, by the way. He was a, a pretty uh, colorful character, got in a lot of trouble. There's a lot of question about how he died at the end of his career. He got in notable knife fights and was pursued by the law and all kinds of interesting things. In any case, early on in his career, when he's breaking out of this larger workshop where he had been painting things like you see here in the foreground of the painting known as Young Bacchus, uh, still life paintings, paintings of flowers and fruits and so forth. When he broke out of that, 
he seemed to have gotten a clientele of Roman patrons around him who were interested in homoerotic subjects. And so the young Bacchus, I, I frankly, I just bring this up because we we looked at Donatello's David and we talked a little bit about Leonardo and Michelangelo's own sexuality. And I wanted to say again that even in a Catholic nation, there are homosexual people in the world there and they want works of art that are erotic to them. And this is one of those. Um, it's called the young Bacchus. Bacchus is the god of wine, um, uh, you know, the Roman name for the Greek god Dionysus. <clears throat> but in this case, it's clearly not Bacchus. And what I mean by that is this is it's kind of like those female nudes where they call them Venuses, but they're really just beautiful women lying on a bed giving you a come hither look. This is clearly a young uh, man from Rome, a very pretty young man who is taking off his robe here for you. Um, and it's all fiction. It's all fantasy. It's all make-believe kind of erotic encounter. He's very clearly kind of got fake, you know, leaves in his hair and grapes in his hair. You can see his tan on his face and his hands, but it doesn't extend to his body, which lets you know this is, you know, a street youth and so forth. Uh, and he's offering you a, a glass of wine as if to, you know, further this homoerotic encounter. In the foreground, the fruit is painted incredibly naturalistically. It, it looks like real fruit, um, and it, you can even pick out, as many people have, uh, there's a fungus on one of the fruits there. It's so accurately painted that they know exactly what kind of fungus that is. But the key component is, if you look here, follow my cursor in the foreground, these fruits here are all past their prime. They're so ripe that they are going bad. And this was a common um, symbol in still life painting, uh, where you would show this incredible plenty, these fruits that are associated with fertility and so forth, or with luxury or with pleasure, but they're going past their prime, they're getting rotted, and that's supposed to be a kind of memento more, remember that term, a reminder of death, so as to say to people, don't get too caught up in your worldly pleasures, you know, there's uh, the next life to live. Uh, in heaven, should you follow the rules, um, which, again, has led a lot of people to wonder, is this a little bit of a warning to people who are attracted to young, beautiful street boys in Rome not to pursue their pleasures? Or is it kind of like those female nudes, the Vanitas pictures, that on the one hand are um, supposed to be what? They're supposed to be kind of warnings against the very thing that they are showing you the pleasures that they're showing you. In any case, much more important for this lecture is this work. Your text just focuses on the calling of St. Matthew. I've decided not to include that here because they do a good job of it. It's a wonderful work. Instead, what I'm focusing on here is a work that's called The Entombment. Uh, in The Entombment, the context is key for this work. This was a work of art that was commissioned by a uh, a church that was one of the most important counter-reformation churches. It was called the Congregation of the Oratory. It was a giant church in Rome that was made popular by a very famous counter-reformation Catholic priest, St. Philip Neri, who preached the idea that in order to combat Protestantism, Catholics had to create emotional, theatrical works of art or inspiring um, very theatrical, very dramatic sermons um, that could educate the masses, and it needed to be pitched to them in a way that they could understand it, and this is a great example of that. We'll start with this. We'll work our way through the stylistics. Um, again, entombment scenes are pretty common to you now, but if we work our way through the stylistics, we start with naturalism. Notice all the naturalism here, first starting with Jesus in the center. <clears throat> Jesus has a nice body, but it's no perigino, right? It's not a perfect idealized body. It looks like a very believable body. And even more so, it's a body with weight. Um, you know, it's a, a dead body, and people are really struggling to hold that body up. 
the key character here in the foreground is Nicodemus again, and he's a gigantic man. Look at these gigantic legs, and he's really struggling to hold them up. So it's got that kind of naturalism of trying to hold up a dead body while you attempt to place him in his tomb, which is right down here at the bottom of the painting. The other major naturalistic component of this is right here, if you follow my cursor, that's the Virgin Mary. And in a moment, I'll show you a close-up of her, but you can see she is older here. She's not a young, beautiful woman like Michelangelo uh, in his Pieta. She's a woman who shows her age, so we're showing that naturalism. When it comes to quotations or a careful reinterpretation of classicism, notice again that this body of Jesus Christ looks suspiciously like Michelangelo's David in the Pieta. He's quoting Michelangelo again, and by the way, his namesake uh, is Michelangelo. He was named Michelangelo Morisi, was Caravaggio. Uh, in order to show you, he knows exactly how great Michelangelo was. He wants you to be thinking about that wonderful Pieta work, uh, but that he's going to be doing something different in his own work. When it comes to the emotionality, it almost goes without saying that this work's highly emotional. In the background here is one of those nondescript Marys pleading to God in the sky, how could you let this happen, right? Showing a really kind of energetic emotional quality. Next to her, a little bit quieter emotion is Mary Magdalene. We know it's her because she's crying into this uh, handkerchief that she'll use to wipe the feet of Christ off. And then, of course, we know Mary. Uh, she is contemplative of what, as well in her emotion. She's a little bit more reposed. But look at John the Evangelist over here, who's barely shining out of the dark light in the background. He looks shocked that his Messiah has died, and he has every reason to, because along with the emotionality is this theatrical little element where, in attempting to hold up Christ, his fingers have slipped into the wound that Christ was given while on the cross. He was stabbed into the side to hasten his death, and you can feel those fingers going into the body of Christ that shows that kind of shock that he has on his face. Also, uh, contributing to the emotional quality of this work is Caravaggio's technique of what's known as tenebrism. Tenebrism is making things in the foreground really light and making the background really dark. It's this high contrast between the foreground and that absent, very dark background. That's tenebrism. Uh, and it heightens the theatricality of works of art. Um, by creating these very high contrasts between light and dark, which, uh, you know, is used in theater, for instance, to heighten the theatricality of the work. Also, only included in this are reds and blacks and whites, very stark contrasts of colors here as well. And then on to number four. Number four in our stylistics is the inclusion of the viewer in the space to manipulate you. And right here for this work of art, you're included in the space by being, look at these things that break that picture plane, the elbow of, Car uh, of uh, uh, Nicodemus here or the corner of the tombstone here that breaks out into your space. And the place that is left for you is as if you are standing in the tomb waiting for them to deliver Christ down to you, which is going to uh, include you in the scene and make you more of a participant in the scene, thus heightening the, uh, the emotion of this. By the way, this is almost a life-size work of art. There's more to this work, though, that ties it to the Counter-Reformation in particular. When this work was first created, it hung on a wall right above the altar. So that space I was saying that you stand in to hold that body is the space that originally the head priest of the congregation of the oratory, this church, would have stood while performing mass, and the body of Christ would have seemed as if it were one step away from being lowered down onto the altar. Now, the reason this has to do with uh, Catholicism and the Counter-Reformation is that for Catholics, as I've said before, they believe that the host, the, the wafer that you eat during the communion, that Holy Eucharistic ceremony, is literally the body of Christ that has been transubstantiated, whereas Protestants believe it's just a commemorative act. So here we get a kind of literalization of that idea where the body of Christ is being laid down or seeming 
one step away from being laid down on an altar and the priests are there performing the the holy communion ceremony and preparing the wafers to distribute to uh you know the congregation and it's to say to them this really is the body of christ some other things that are kind of low brow uh, symbolism are and it's very, again, Catholic. Remember how we said that Peter was given the task of building the Church of Christ, which becomes the Catholic Church, and he becomes the, co Jesus is the, co uh, excuse me, cornerstone of the Catholic Church. And here you see literally the corner of a stone to make that symbolism. And then finally, in case you get too worried about or sad about Christ's death, in the tomb itself is an evergreen, a little fern, and every, every kind of evergreen plant that you see, especially when they're associated with a religious scene, is a symbol of the resurrection. This is to say to people that Christ will be reborn. Don't worry. Now let's look at a couple of details here. The nondescript Mary and the high emotional quality on her face against that dark background. Jim Mary here. Um, who looks her age next to the youthful, more beautiful Mary Magdalene. Notice as well how, I should have said this earlier, how her hand, this is actually the Virgin Mary's hand reaching out here, looks suspiciously like the hand in Leonardo da Vinci's Madonna of the Rocks, which is meant to be a protective gesture. He's probably quoting uh, Leonardo there as well or the face of Nicodemus, who engages us. He looks back out at us. He uh, acknowledges that we exist, and this includes us in the scene, along with those other elements that I talked about. Briefly, I wanted to show you another of these works that is very naturalistic with a high degree of theatricality. This is The Death of the Virgin Mary. Um, this work was not accepted by the people who commissioned it because it was too naturalistic. Remember that, for the most part, Catholics thought that when the Virgin Mary died, she was immediately assumed into heaven right at the moment of her pending death. And instead, here, Caravaggio has showed you the Virgin Mary actually dead here, while all the apostles, now much older in age, are coming to pay their respects and Mary Magdalene cries in the foreground. The big controversy about this was actually that Caravaggio may or may not have used a prostitute who had died, she had supposedly drowned in the Arno River, as his model, and of course that was seen as inappropriate as a model for the Virgin Mary. Step of her. Looking dead, looking bloated, you know, actually showing her death. Again, I wanted to show you some of these things just very quickly. I wish I could spend forever on them, but it gives you a sense of how these are different than what we saw. And I'll just kind of back up here for a minute to the entombment scene as well. Different than what you see in classical works of art for all the reasons that I've gone over, but also in the way that the compositions are set up. Look at how everything here is set up on a diagonal. Everything looks like it's in movement, like it's going to tip over. That will be very common in the Baroque period, including this work here that's called the Conversion of St. Paul. The Conversion of St. Paul is a story in which, uh, in the New Testament, in which Paul, who was originally Saul, is on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, actually, when he is called by God uh, to to follow the path of Jesus. Now, most of the time when you see this picture done before the Baroque period, Paul's just riding along on a horse and there's like a light shining out of a cloud and he's had this mystical conversion. Um, and it's not very uh, theatrical at all. In this case, though, Paul has been so hit by the light of conversion that he's fallen from his horse. He's lying prostrate on his back um, almost unaware that the horse's hoof is raised above him, about to stomp down on a very tender part of Paul, because he is so wrapped up in witnessing the word and the light of God, his eyes are rolled back in his head, that he can't think of anything else. Now again, Caravaggio has used all of these devices to heighten the, the theatricality of this, 
uh, including that tenebrism, dark background, light foreground, lots of diagonals of the hands uh, here, the theatricality of this raised hoof above his uh, midsection here as well, and some other things. Everything looks bigger than it actually is because Caravaggio has set this composition so that the frame of the picture is very close to the horse's back, making him look even bigger, and extending the hand of uh, St. Paul here off of the uh, scene, making everything feel fairly claustrophobic. Work, same things going on here, right? A greater degree of naturalism in this one. Look at St. Peter here. He looks like an old guy, right? He's at the end of his life. He's a very strong old guy, but he looks like an old guy. And um, so that's involved in this. Uh, you've got way more naturalism. You've got a lot of theatricality with that dark background and high lit foreground. Um, you've got a scene that's in movement that tends to lead to greater drama. Um, they're just kind of pulling his cross up here. And if you're wondering, it looks all backwards. It's because the story goes that um, St. Peter, when he was to be crucified, didn't think he was worthy of being crucified in the same way as his Savior Jesus, so he asked to be crucified upside down. Talk about going the extra distance here, St. Peter. Uh, and so he is actually being uh, crucified inverted here. You also have an inclusion of you in the scene. Look at how in the foreground, uh, all these things are here. This is money that has been spent uh, in order to capture Peter. Is right there in front of you, and the whole scene kind of extends out into your realm as if you are witnessing this firsthand as a participant in the scene itself. And uh, just let me pause here for a minute. You won't witness much, but we're going to come back with his very um, theatrical uh, work, Judith and Holofernes. Give me one second here. Okay, so with this one, uh, the subject matter, because it's not a subject that you've seen before yet. Uh, it's from the Old Testament, and uh, a lot of the this subject was actually part of the Apocrypha, which are these non-codified biblical texts, uh, and thus there's a lot more room for interpretation when it comes to these types of subjects than the codified biblical texts like the crucifixion or something of that sort. Uh, in this subject, the way that it goes is that Judith was an Israelite, and she was, um, the Israelites were being threatened by this very powerful Assyrian general and his army, and they were almost assuredly going to lose, uh, and instead of letting this happen, Judith decides that she will take matters into her own hands. It's one of the few places that we have a female hero in the biblical text. And the way she does this differs in the various writings on the subject, but the general story is the same. She finds a way to sneak into the, um, the Assyrian encampment, and she does this either in some of the stories because she's a very wealthy woman and she says she's bailing on the Jews and she's going to bring her wealth to the Assyrians if they take her in, or in other stories, she, the emphasis is placed on her youthful beauty, and she seduces Holofernes. Well, in any case, she wakes, makes her way into the, the encampment and uh, sits with Holofernes, drinks with him, probably flirts with him a little bit, promises him either wealth or sex or both. And after he's drunk a lot um, and has basically passed out, she cuts his head off and... It puts it in a bag and takes it back. She sneaks out of the, uh, the encampment back to the side of the Israelites. And the next morning, as the Assyrians are waiting to attack, the head is taken out of the bag and shown to them. And they're so fearful about the power of the Judaic God uh, that they, they, they lose this war. So you see a woman, uh, you know, achieving 
something powerful here. Remember, we read about Berger's idea that women appear and men act. Well, here we see a woman actually acting, doing something. But um, in Caravaggio's work, uh, you know, there's a lot about this that may be kind of hedging its bets on exactly how much work um, Judith put into this scenario. And what I mean by that is, um, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Obviously, you can see the theatricality, right? Uh, we've got an incredibly gruesome scene of a head being cut off here and the spurt of blood coming out, and the screaming face of uh, Holofernes here, uh, obviously theatrical. You've got a very typical device in the Baroque period, this this curtain that has been drawn back like a theatrical curtain to show you the scene and the tenebrism of the dark background and reds and whites again against that background heightening the dramatic effect. The entire composition is made up of a series of diagonals rather than pyramidal forms, right? Diagonals of the arm, of the shoulders, of the tip of the head and so forth. Uh, these all increase the theatrical drama. You're also included in the scene. Look at how you're right here in the scene, in the room with them while watching this uh, unfold. That's uh, another way to increase the drama of the scene. As I said before, um, there are some components of this in which uh, typical ideas about femininity during the time period show their way into Caravaggio's work in a way that they don't show up in the same manner in the next work we'll see by a woman artist. And what I mean by that is, if you were to guess, you know, how did Judith find her way into the encampment of Holofernes, every emphasis has been placed on how beautiful this young woman is, right? Including juxtaposing her beautiful and kind of, you know, um, well, she's repulsed uh, face next to the older face of the maid servant who is helping her out. This juxtaposition of old kind of crone look versus the youthful look makes her even more beautiful and emphasizes the idea that she probably accomplished a lot of this by using her beauty in order to seduce Holofernes. Going beyond that, too, some of you will know, and I hope you don't tell anyone else about this, that this is not the way that you're going to cut through a neck, right? She's holding the sword kind of backwards here. She's um, barely touched it to his neck, and she's already halfway through. You can tell this because it's just started to spurt blood here. How does that occur? And what Caravaggio would have been asking us to consider is that her hand and her actions are all being kind of dictated by God, who is helping her to achieve this task. She shows that repulsion on her face, too, not because we're supposed to think that Judith isn't a strong woman, but rather to say that women of the time were not supposed to act uh, violently, and she is properly repulsed by this action that she has to take um, in order to save the Israelites, rather than, let's say, being happy about doing this action. Now, juxtapose this again. We're moving now beyond Caravaggio to Artemisia Gentileschi, who is the first woman artist we've seen um, here in this class, uh, to any real degree. Um, you see a lot of changes here, but before I talk about those changes, I want to give you a little backdrop on Artemisia Gentileschi, and you've got a very short reading of her um, basically being pretty grumpy about the fact that her patrons are consistently not paying her on time or refusing to pay her at all, which is probably something that occurred to her more often being a woman artist than it did to male artists. Artemisia Gentileschi, like most women artists of the time periods we're covering, um, came into art through her family's business. Her father was an artist. The family had been artists for a while, and they were followers of Caravaggio. Um, they emulated his style. She, uh, One of the reasons you don't have a lot of women artists in the history of art is, number one, that an artist's studio, the place that they work, these, these you know, businesses were not particularly safe places for women. 
Um, and this includes Artemisia Gentileschi. She was raped in her own father's studio, believe it or not, by a fellow uh, artist. And the solution to this, just so you can get a grip on what time period we're in, was that the father and her rapist uh, decided that in order to save her from being seen as kind of damaged goods, she would have to marry this rapist. And the father agreed to this. The The painter who raped her, um, though, eventually reneged on his promise, and they had to take him to court and sue him over this, where everything about this sullied situation became public knowledge. Artemisia went on to become an extraordinarily popular artist during her own time period and a, a major, major figure in the history of art. Let's look at this work up. Remember I said before that on your quiz number two, you're going to be asked to compare and contrast two works on the same subject that are treated a little differently by different artists. And this is a, a perfect example of that. In this work of art, some of the differences are Number one, that, you know, it's taking some time to cut this head off Holofernes. Um, she doesn't just touch the sword to his neck and it goes right through it. She's kind of got it on there and the maidservant is on top of him, holding him down. And she's sawing through this neck where you can see the blood staining the sheets. It's been coming out for a while here. And, you know, she holds his head down very strongly. Um, she doesn't look as repulsed as the other figure does. There's spatters of blood on her as well. Um, this is to emphasize, and I think it comes from a woman thinking her way through, like, if I were Judith, how would this unfold? Um, it comes through an artist thinking, you know, how much work it would take to actually achieve this, this heroic act. Number two, there isn't the same emphasis placed on Judith's beauty. Um, she looks, I mean, she's fine and all, but she's not uh, a particularly kind of beautiful woman, at least by the standards of the day. And instead, you see this little gold uh, bracelet on her arm. The emphasis is placed on her being a woman of means who's maybe seduced her way into the camp, not through her body, but through her wealth here. Um the other big thing about this is that in the Caravaggio work, if you're looking at that man's body, it's really, really detailed and muscular and so forth. This is because Caravaggio, being a male artist, would have had access to males, live male models to study anatomy with, and women were not allowed to study the male nude. Um, and so this body is a little bit more doughy. Its, uh, its anatomy is not as accurate. And that's one of the things that held women back. They weren't allowed to do the same things that male artists were. But even more importantly, in this case, it makes Holofernes, to me anyway, look incredibly vulnerable in a way that the other man didn't look vulnerable. That other guy basically wakes up. He's still strong and virile, but his head's suddenly off. And in this case, this guy wakes up to feel his head being sawed off. He's trying to fight back, but he's slowly kind of expiring as this is occurring. And uh, to me, that makes him look even more vulnerable and maybe not a place that a male artist would want to go, uh, acknowledging male um, vulnerability here. Now, the subject a lot of different times. Um, this is just a, I just wanted to show you this briefly. This is uh, Judith and the maidservant with the head of Holofernes on their way out after they've cut it off and they've got it wrapped up in a, a bag here, kind of secretly escaping the zone. All that theatricality of the dramatic lighting and the curtain in the background and all the diagonals continue to be true. And it's worth pointing this out. This is called La Pitura. It's a self-portrait of Artemisia Gentileschi herself. And it's not surprising that Artemisia's body type and her likeness oftentimes turns up in the figures that she paints. Judith looks suspiciously like Artemisia Gentileschi herself. It's probably because she's using herself as a model for these figures, but it also shows a certain degree of, um, you know, her creativity of thinking herself in these scenes. In the self-portrait, what she's doing is she's painting. Obviously, she's got a palette in one hand and brushes under her finger here, and she's painting on the surface of a canvas in front of her. Um, this is showing 
her kind of ideal of who she is. This is not that common for women painters, believe it or not. Um, they oftentimes just showed portraits of themselves looking beautiful. So she's showing herself in the act of actually painting. And she's also associating herself in the symbolism of the, um, the linked necklace with a little uh, mask on the end of it. This is symbolic. Every link in the chain ties her to other artists who came before her. She is one of those links going back in time. And the mask at the end is um, for painting itself, which was known as a mimetic art or an art that created illusions of the world around us, just like masks create illusions. One of the works of art by Art Misha Janileski that really shows you a woman artist thinking her way through biblical subjects is this famous one that she did very early on in her career called uh, Susanna and the Elders. Um, we haven't looked at the subject before, but it had been painted a number of times, thousands of times by this point in pretty predictable ways. Um, so let me tell you the subject first. In this, again, Old Testament subject, uh, Susanna is a beautiful woman who is married, who, like all Ju Judaic women, uh, you know, goes to the bath in order to, on the one hand, cleanse herself, and on the other hand, to purify herself. The baths were oftentimes ritual acts that were taken after menses, for instance, and so they're associated with purity. While she's going to these baths, older, what are called elders of her Judaic community, um, who are smitten by her beauty, start spying on her, and then they approach her and try to blackmail her into having sex with them by saying to her, listen, if you don't have sex with us, we will tell everyone that we caught you in the woods uh, having sex with another man who is not your wife, and you'll be stoned to death for adultery. Now, Susanna says, forget it. I'm not going to do it anyway. I'd rather die than lie uh, about anything, so do your best. And so they do, they go back to the, the village and they say, we caught her there, she was doing this thing, and she is poised to be killed for adultery because no one believes the one woman over the two elders until Daniel, uh, in this famous story, comes and in the first instance ever documented of a cross-examination, uh, separates the two elders, asks them to tell their story, and their stories don't line up, and so she's eventually freed. But we don't see that in this moment. In this moment, what we see are the two elders trying to solicit uh, sex from her, and she is responding um, you know, in, in a really dramatic way. Look at how her body is all set up of these diagonals, how she turns away from the you know, this this elder who's saying, Shh, don't tell anyone, we just have sex, and then, you know, you won't get killed, um, just do what we want you to do. But she's repulsed by this whole thing. The elders also, look at how there's two of them, there's two over one, they are elders, and they hover over her, pressing her down. She doesn't have any clothes, they have clothes on, everything plays up her vulnerability here. Now, the reason I point this out is that typically when the subject was represented, it was almost like an excuse to show a beautiful nude woman and have this kind of titillating uh, sense of her being in a compromised situation that could be covered by this biblical story. It's a little, it is a little bit of a cover story. So here I juxtapose it by a work by Correcto. He's the guy who did that Last Supper scene that you saw before of Susanna and the Elders. Now, in this scene of Susanna and the Elders, and it's pretty typical, you can barely pick out the Elders. They're on each side of this hedge, um, just creepily looking in on her. And instead of showing her anguish or pain or, uh, you know, being distraught with this situation that she finds herself in, Susanna's just shown as a beautiful nude um, with a mirror in front of her and, you know, oils to anoint her body and reflections of, you know, all parts of her body. Basically, these works of art, Tintoretto's, that is, set you up as a voyeur to witness a scene that's supposed to be horrible, but they don't really show you any of the horror of it. Instead, they allow you to participate in the titillating kind of erotic component of these works without thinking on how they impact 
in this case, Susanna. They are, as we said last time, devil articulations. They allow for you to have the very pleasure that they are condemning, and Artemisius doesn't look like that, or to show you one more of these by a later French artist who we won't be covering in this class. I mean, if you were just to look at this work that's on the right here, another Suzanne and the Elders. Now, the Elders are creepy as hell, um, but honestly, it's hard to tell if Susanna is all that distraught over the situation. If this was called the seduction of so-and-so, I think we'd all buy it. You know, it's just an excuse to show a beautiful woman in a compromised situation. Back to this one again. The details on this that you know, I, I wanted to point out, besides those I already have, is that if you're wondering if this is so much about her pain, why is he showing her nude, or why is she showing her nude? The reason is that, again, this work wants to set up the situation as if you're included in the scene. You, as a presumed heterosexual male viewer, are supposed to look at her, think, wow, she is super hot and beautiful. I wish I could have her. That's what people at the time, one presumes, would have thought. And then have to think, oh, but if I did that, look at the pain it would cause her. Now, what did Berger say about this situation? Is she a nude or is she naked? And the answer, I think, is that she approximates Berger's concept of nakedness much more than she does the nude, because we have to think of her feelings in this situation. She can't just be an object of our desire. We have to think, oh, she's gorgeous, but this is horrible. If I did this, it would make her feel this way. And thus, it makes it more of a naked picture. Quickly then, um, Italy, uh, one of the traditions that really gets going during the Baroque period are illusionistic ceiling frescoes. And I wanted to show you a few of these before turning to Bernini and sculpture. This is a work by Guido Greni called Aurora. And it is, like so many of these works, it was painted on the ceiling of a barrel vaulted uh, space for a very rich patron uh, a space that actually led into an atrium and an open area, greenhouse, and so forth. And so the subject fits in perfectly, and it's just meant to be, a, you know, a beautiful decorative work. It doesn't have any kind of religious symbolism to it. Aurora is basically the dawn, and you see her out front, in front of everyone, and behind her is Apollo, the sun god of the Greeks and Romans, leading his sun chariot, calling the, the sun in for the day, and he's accompanied by all these beautiful naiads who are kind of lesser deities uh, of the sky. Now, it you should be able to see this couldn't possibly be a classical work of art because notice the composition is very asymmetrical. Everything's moving out into this space. If you cut it down the middle, there's not equal weight at all on both sides of this. Also, there's way too much movement for this to be a classical work of art. It's not set up on horizontals and verticals or pyramidal shapes. It's all kind of moving off into this space with figures turning back and forth uh, and seeming to actually move here. But the real reason I show this to you is to say the way that this ceiling fresco works is much the same as Michelangelo's work on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which is called Quadra Riportato in Italian. It just means four-corner transfer. And what that means is that the orientation that you're seeing this picture in now, as if it were hanging on a wall, is the same orientation that you would see it, see it on a ceiling. They just take something that could have looked like it was on a wall and transfer it to a ceiling. But if we turn to look at the same subject by Giovanni Guercino here, Aurora, you see a quite different and much more complex spatial system, something that's very similar to the Correggio Assumption of the Virgin work that we saw earlier this quarter. This is also on a barrel vaulted ceiling, so it's got a, a little arch to it. But in this perspective, it's as if you're looking up through buildings, and these are all painted, to an opening where you see from below Apollo and Aurora in front of him. Now, these things are really cool. If you end up in Europe um, and see a work, and these, by the way, are called Di Soto in Su, up from under paintings. 
painted as if the perspective is down below them. You will go to these places and you'll see a big red dot on the floor that says stand here. Because anywhere else you stand because of the perspectival system, they don't work. You have to be in a perfect space. For instance, when you walk into this room, the picture on the right is the same as the picture on the left. When you first walk into it and you're not on that spot, the whole thing looks like some weird, melting, surrealist painting because the perspective only works from that one spot on the floor below it. They're a little bit like, if you've seen those before, those types of chalk drawings that people do on sidewalks that look really hyper-illusionistic. Um, like a big hole in the ground, but then if you see them from the side, they're all stretched out so as to uh, convince you of that illusion. This is called di sotto in su, or up from under. The most elaborate of all of these ceiling frescoes of the Baroque period in Italy is this one done by Giovanni Battista Galli in the flagship church of the Jesuit order in Rome, Il Gesù. Some of you probably know the Jesuit order, which I mentioned before, really gets going during the Counter-Reformation period. Igno uh, Ignatius Loyola is the major kind of starter of this movement. The uh, Jesuits were tasked with defending the Pope on theological grounds from the Protestants, and then, of course, they become famous at starting universities all throughout the world and proselytizing and so forth. In any case, in the main space of this flagship church, what they had painted by um, this guy, uh, Giovanni Battista Galli, is a scene of the Last Judgment. And actually, um, the next artist that you'll see, the sculptor Gian Lorenzo Bernini, also helped out with this work. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But all of this, follow my cursor here, all of this is the architecture of the room. And in this inset in the center is the painting. Um, and the painting is a scene of the Last Judgment. So Christ sitting in judgment over all people except that it's very counter-reformation in that they don't actually depict Jesus. Remember um, what you read about, um, uh, you know, last week when it came to uh, the propriety of religious imagery in the Council of Trent and um, what Martin Luther had to say, that according to the Bible, it's forbidden to represent God, uh, and it's maybe even questionable to represent Jesus after he's gone back up into heaven. And the Jesuits take this very seriously. So instead of showing Jesus himself, they just show an incredibly bright light uh, up here emanating from, you know, heaven. And in that bright light is actually the initials of Jesus Christ, IHS, which also happened to be the monogram of the Jesuit order rather than an actual representation of Jesus. And then the figures are either being drawn up into the light or being cast out of the light down into our space of the actual church, those who, uh, you know, are judged to be sinful and condemned to death are falling out of this, what looks like a big skylight in the room. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. All of these figures that you see falling out of this space, they're painted, but they're actually painted on stucco. Um, that has been modeled so that they're actually sculptures that get more and more three-dimensional the farther they get from this space so that they look like real figures falling out of this space painted incredibly illusionistically and uh, created out of uh, stucco uh, in other words these are all sculptures they look incredibly realistic it's almost like the baroque version of imax theater of something and why is this important because if you were to walk into the space, it's making you think if the last judgment happened right now and I am here in the space in which this is occurring, would I go up to heaven or would I be cast into hell? It includes you in that space. In other words, it heightens that dramatic interaction with the work itself. In fact, it's so trompe loy fool the eye, that you can see some of these shadows that are on the ceiling of the architecture themselves. That's all painted on there to look like a shadow as if this is the light source that is casting that shadow. Get in a little bit closer there. Again, painted on 
a barrel vaulted ceiling, but these figures are all in higher, like this will be low relief and then getting higher and higher relief sculptures painted to look incredibly illusionistic. When you have this degree of hyper illusion uh, in a ceiling fresco, it's called, called quadratura, quadratura. These are all hand, uh, terms on your handout, by the way. So let's look at a major sculpt of the Baroque period in Italy. This is the work of Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Gian Lorenzo Bernini um, is exemplary when it comes to Baroque sculpture, and his work, although not perhaps as famous as Michelangelo's, is, I, I dare to say, a lot more complex in its composition. Um, if you're wondering what the hell you're looking at here, and if I've got the slide wrong because it looks like you're looking at something from behind, this is on purpose. This is a work called um, Apollo and Daphne. And the story of Apollo and Daphne is one of those Greek myths that's about mischief. In this case, Apollo, who's the sun god and the god of beauty and poetry and so forth, who for the very most part in all the Greek myths is a, a good guy. He's never out chasing the ladies. Uh, in this story, um, what happens is that Cupid, and I, you know, depending on which story you're reading, the motivations for this can be quite different. But Cupid decides it'll be fun uh, to shoot Apollo with one of his arrows to inflame his lust. And then when Apollo sees Daphne, uh, Cupid shoots Daphne with one of his black arrows that makes her not be interested in Apollo at all. And then he sits back and watches this chase unfold where the virginal um, nymph, uh, Daphne, is escaping Apollo, who is the most beautiful of all the gods, of the male gods anyway. Uh, and since the whole subject matter is about a chase scene, how do you deal with this in a sculpture? It's all about Apollo pursuing Daphne. There's no real major moment in this. It's one series of events after another, getting closer to her, you know, her calling out in anguish and so forth. Well, the way that Bernini dealt with this is that he created a composition and a sculpture in which, and I don't have enough slides to make this work perfectly, as you walk around the sculpture, and this is how you would have seen it in its original setting. You start by seeing it from behind. As you walk around it, you get more and more information about what's actually happening. And the space between Apollo Daph and Daphne, which starts fairly big, seems to collapse more and more as you get further around the sculpture. So, for instance, in this uh, viewpoint, you can barely see what Apollo is chasing. You just see kind of some trees out in front of him. And this is, again, part of Baroque sculpture versus that static quality of classical sculptures. As you get around this, and again, if I had more slides, this would work better, you can see that Apollo is actually chasing a woman, uh, Daphne here, and he's fairly close to her, but you can't see exactly how close. A lot of beautiful, beautiful details in this sculpture. It's incredibly complex, right? Um, and I just wanted to show you some of this. As you get around to the front of this, notice what's happened. Um, now you can see the hand of Apollo reaching out and grabbing Daphne, and Daphne kind of crying out in anguish as she's being caught. And in the story, what happens at this moment is that Daphne calls out to her father, who is a kind of lesser god of the woods, and he saves her by turning her into a laurel tree. And so she is sprouting roots out of her feet and her hands are springing into leaves because she's becoming a tree. Look at this from the other side. You can't even see his face anymore. She's totally been transformed into a tree. The billowing cape kind of uh, encapsulates both of them, right? And so this is a part of Baroque sculpture, compositions that are in the round and meant to be seen from multiple different viewpoints, not just that one perfect viewpoint like Michelangelo's David was. These ones you can see from every single vantage point, the artist has taken those all into account. It makes them more theatrical. It includes you in the scene in uh, you know, a more engaged way.
Perhaps Bernini's most famous sculpture is his sculpture of David. We know all about David, slayed Goliath and all of that. Um, this, by the way, is, for those who are wondering, this is a way that they hold up marble sculptures. And in, in this case, it's armor that was originally given to David, but it was too big, so he couldn't wear it. Uh, and so it's been placed into this composition because it's a part of the story, but also primarily to hold that sculpture up. Now, how is this different? Remember, we're working towards a compare and contrast question for the last quiz. How is this different than Michelangelo's David? Number one, Michelangelo's David looks like he's gonna stand there from all time. He's full of repose, he's idealistic. Um, there's no real drama in this scene. You're not included in the scene. You're not expected to walk around it. Whereas Bernini's David looks much more naturalistic. That body looks more like a real human being. Uh, it's more dramatic in the sense that he is in the middle of an action. One can imagine his body going through the motion of slinging this rock from one position to the next. He's showing some emotion on his face. He's actually having to concentrate and shows a little bit of anger to, to vanquish this foe. If you move around the sculpture, from every vantage point, this thing looks like it's in motion. And include you in that scene. The thing to point out about these things is that the sculptures of the Baroque period are oftentimes deeply undercut, really, really high relief on their faces, because they were meant to be lighted in this dramatic fashion that you see here, so just to increase that theatricality. I'm going to pause here again for a moment so I can grab uh, a little reading to go along with this work, which is uh, Bernini's great masterpiece known as St. Teresa of Avila in Ecstasy. What you're looking at here, this famous sculpture by Gian Lorenzo Bernini called the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila was a very famous counter-reformation nun and mystic, meaning that she said that she witnessed um, through these divine revelations of an angel um, the words of God firsthand. Um, now, for the most part, Catholics tended to, in the counter-reformation period, be pretty uh, suspect of people claiming mystical uh, unions with God because it sounded a lot like Protestants, right? Protestants said that people had a almost one-to-one -one relationship with God, and a lot of people got in trouble uh, by the Inquisition for claiming to have mystical visions, but St. Teresa was so popular uh, that they they didn't persecute her. In fact, they embraced her uh, heavily uh, for these mystical revelations, and she was almost immediately turned into a saint or canonized uh, after her death, and she became incredibly popular. Um, this is a space that is in a church. It's a private chapel for the Cornaro family, um, and they are the ones who commissioned this work of art. Now, everything that you're seeing here was actually composed by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Even though he didn't paint all of this painting in the top here, which is heaven, he didn't create the stained glass, but he came up with the design for it up here. Um, and he picked out all the stone, all the marble, all the architectural setting for this major sculpture that is right down here in the middle of the work of art. So the way this works is you've got a scene in which God is in the, um, in the the stained glass and above him is the Holy Spirit. And then his rays kind of come down here into the space of the sculpture itself to illuminate it. Now the scene that is being depicted by Bernini here comes directly from the writings of St. Teresa of Avila. She kept these diaries about her mystical visions uh, in which she talked about this encounter with this beautiful young angel and her love of God that was inspired by these encounters. Now, for a contemporary audience, these, these divine revelations that she received sound really, you know, they hover on the verge of being almost like an erotic encounter, and that's been played up by Bernini here quite a bit. 
Um, and I'll read you this passage, and then I'll talk about how he's played this up. And I'm just going to read a, a brief portion of this. And by the way, she, she spoke of this many, many times in much the same terms. Quote, I saw in his hands, this is the angel, I saw in his hands a large golden dart. And at the end of the iron tip, there appeared to be a little fire. It seemed to me that this angel plunged the dart several times deep within me so that it reached my heart and even deeper. When he drew it out, I thought he was carrying off with him the deepest part of me, and he left me all afire with a great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan and moan, and the sweetness this greatest pain caused me was so superabundant that there is no desire capable of taking it away, nor is the soul content with less than God. The pain is not bodily, but spiritual, although the body doesn't fail to share in some of it, and even a great deal. Now, uh, again, one of the reasons that this there's a kind of erotic element to this is not only the language that she chooses, but also because many people of this time period believe that the closest approximation that most mortal people could have to the experience that St. Teresa had that was very spiritual was a kind of sexual eroticism, basically orgasmic pleasure. Now, they weren't saying that St. Teresa was having you know, orgasmic pleasure here, but what they were saying was there's a correlation between the bodily experience of pleasure and the type of divine spiritual pleasure that she's having, and Bernini definitely wants to play this up. So let's get in here a little bit closer. First of all, these are the rays of God shining down. We've got the angel here with his golden dart, although now it's an arrow. And by the way, the angel looks suspiciously like a classical sculpture of Eros or Cupid, as he's better known, who in Greek times was a beautiful young god. And notice where the arrow is pointed. It's much lower than the heart here, and that's done all on purpose, and the arrow or I'm sorry, the, the angel here is lifting up her monk's uh, or nun's habit uh, right around the breast area here. And these are all done on purpose. Here's the angel. One of the things that's so wonderful about a Bernini sculpture is his use of texture. The uh, polished marble of the skin makes him appear youthful. The very dynamic folds of the drapery here look like some kind of lightweight drapery that's being blown in the wind. The feathers of the wings are much more um, roughly hewn, um, but somehow have the, the feeling of, uh, of feathers here. And then we move over to St. Teresa, who for the most part is like a body just enveloped in this, this habit which is all of these swirling kind of waves of dynamic, dynamic energy here that are meant to reference her passion for God. Her mouth is open, her eyes are rolled back in her head, again, meant to be associated with kind of bodily pleasure, but in this case, the correlation is to her spiritual pleasure. And then one other thing, I told you before that this technique that was, let's say, inadvertently established by Michelangelo Bonarotti in his unfinished sculptures, uh, eventually gets adopted by a lot of sculptors because it's so cool. You can put a one texture next to this roughly hewn marble of the cloud here uh, and really kind of pick up the textures, the feeliness of the sculpture. And there's her face with her eyes rolled back in her head. And most people would have thought the closest thing that most people can have on earth to the type of spiritual ecstasy that St. Teresa had would be sexual ecstasy here, and so he's definitely playing that up. Now, this is how it looks when you're actually visiting the site. What's really curious about this is, uh, along with the dramatic lighting and the theatricality of this encounter, off to each side of the sculpture are little like opera boxes. And in those opera boxes are sculptures of the Cornaro family as if they're sitting there in perpetuity witnessing the scenes of this, uh, this woman's spiritual ecstasy. Let's move over to Spain um, quickly. We're gonna spend most of our time on Diego Velasquez here. 
During the time of the Baroque period, um, Spain was, of course, staunchly Catholic and adopted a lot of the same techniques that you saw in Caravaggio and the Italians' works of art. So very, very naturalistic, theatrical scenes, uh, including you in the scene and so forth. This is the work of an artist by the name of Giuseppe di Ribera. He was born in Spain, but he worked for the vast majority of his career in Italy. Uh, he was a follower of Caravaggio. There were so many of these followers of Caravaggio, they called them Caravaggisti. And you see that in the dramatic lighting here and the natural representation of, in this case, the subject is the martyrdom of St. Bartholomew. Now, remember, St. Bartholomew, we've seen him before. He was in Michelangelo's Last Judgment. He was a saint who was martyred uh, for being a Christian and um, the way that he was killed was being flayed alive. So he was skinned alive. In this scene, the naturalism is, of course, on the one hand, St. Bartholomew, who looks like a, an old guy. I mean, there's nothing idealized about this body. And, of course, the, the very, very naturalistic representation of his executioner here, who is sharpening his knife, thus kind of increasing the dramatic moment. But what's so awesome about this work is that while the executioner looks at St. Bartholomew and is sharpening this, this real, it's like a jagged edge, very old, you know, very well-worn knife. I mean, it's, it just makes you, you send shivers up your spine. While he's doing all this, St. Bartholomew can't think of that at all. His eyes are locked on his God. The light source that's shining on him comes from up above, and he's just witnessing his God. He won't feel any of this pain, really, because his belief is so uh, extreme. This is the work of Francisco de Zuberon. Uh, de Zuberon, like so many of the Spanish painters of this time period, painted scenes of saints usually being martyred uh, for their beliefs, and these paintings were actually hung in the monasteries all around Spain. Um, during the time period in Spain, the monastic orders increased in size dramatically. Spain was having a little bit of a tough time when it came to their economy. Uh, there wasn't a lot of money around, and actually the church and the state both tried to push um, young men into going into the monastic orders in order to keep them off the streets and to give them employment by proselytizing. Um, in this, and so these paintings would be hung on the walls of the monasteries kind of like a, as models or exemplary figures that they could emulate as young monks. The scene that you're seeing here by Zuberon is a work called Saint Serapion. Uh, Saint Serapion was a saint, not very well known, who was a member of what was known as the Mercedarian Order. Uh, Mercedarian Order were uh, monks that would go to the Holy Land and trade themselves. I mean, they also, frankly, sometimes were soldiers, but best known for trading themselves in ransom for Christian captives who had been taken uh, by uh, an area of the world, the Holy Land, that was primarily controlled by Muslims during this time period. And in this case, Saint Serapion has sacrificed himself to release a number of Christian captives. And what you're witnessing here is him uh, you know, right before his execution. Uh, so again, the martyrdom of these great men dying for their belief of God or dying in this case for the betterment of people who got themselves into a bind. Uh, it says his name in this little cardellino over here at St. Serapion, and then he has very prominently displayed on the front of his habit a, uh, a badge of the Mercedarian order. Again, it's very theatrical. Um, it's set up with a series of kind of swirling movements and diagonals. It's a little bit off center with its axis. It's got that very dark background. And it just is meant to bring you into proximity to this great man who sacrificed himself for the betterment of others. Are you another one of these by Zuberan? There are literally dozens of these. The same thing, a single martyr or a single saint uh, who is set up as an exemplar for young monks to kind of emulate. This is St. Francis of Assisi, the uh, the saint who, of course, was followed by the Franciscan order of monks, 
You can always tell St. Francis um, by his the rope that is used to tie his, in this case, very uh, rough-hewn cow. It's got three knots in it. Those three knots are symbolic of obedience, charity, and chastity. Uh, St. Francis was an ascetic monk. He's someone who divorced himself from worldly pleasures and just went out to contemplate God and receive divine revelation through God. You can't see this very well, but beneath the cowl of his cloak, his eyes are actually wide open and staring uh, at the majesty of God. He also holds in his hand a, a symbol of, uh, you know, his, his asceticism, uh, which is the skull. Uh, he doesn't care uh, a bit about worldly goods. Look at how beaten up his cowl is here. He's just locked in on his thoughts about God and heaven and doing right by God. important artist of this period in Spain, without question, is Diego Velazquez. Uh, Diego Velazquez started as a young painter in Sevilla, or Seville, um, doing genre scenes such as this. This is called the Water Carrier of Sevilla. Uh, in the Water Carrier of Sevilla, there's no important subject matter here. He's just re representing a guy who had been sitting on a corner selling beautiful, pure water to people in this very hot, hot city, basically in the south of France. Um, so no kind of major biblical subject, although water, as we know, is oftentimes associated with purity and baptism and so forth. Instead, what he's doing is showing you a very naturalistic scene uh, in which he's showing off his incredible skill. What I mean by that is that the textures of this painting, if you were to see it, are remarkable. You can feel them with your eyes. So, for instance, the old, craggled, you know, sun-stricken um, face of the, the water cellar is juxtaposed against the youthful, very kind of soft face of the young boy who's being given the water. The uh, cowl and overcoat of the water carrier is this homespun wool, and you can feel its rough texture, but underneath it is a cotton or linen shirt that has a totally different texture. And then the the you know different vessels that are carrying the water here, the, uh, the coiled um, vessel here versus the glazed vessel over here versus the glass over here, all of the textures are totally um, you know, something that he catches in his painting. He was so good at this stuff that he was called by the king of Spain at the time to come be a court painter. And the king of the time was Philip IV. Uh, Philip IV was one of the Habsburg kings. The Habsburgs were a very rich family, originally oriented, uh, came out of a different part of the world, Austria. Massively, massively wealthy and perhaps best known because they were they're so um, uninterested in sharing their wealth in any way that they tended to intermarry one member of the Habsburg with Mary, another member of the Habsburg over uh, generations, and they developed a congenital deformity, which was this elongated chin um, that if you've ever seen a period movie, they play that up. In any case, when you become a court painter, it becomes pretty straight. Forward, right. Um, one of the big things that you do as a court painter is you paint the king or his family over and over and over again to make them look really good. Now, the way this would usually work is that the king would sit once or twice a year for a likeness and the painter would sketch out or paint out his face. And then the painter would go put that face or that head on different bodies, um, you know, representing different activities of the king. So, for instance, here you see Philip IV uh, being a kind of diplomat in all of his courtly attire. And you can probably see his chin uh, is a bit elongated here. Or, you know, here he is off to the left, a, a chivalrous knight, or on the right being uh, a man about town. I could have shown you 15, 20 more of those types of paintings, but they're kind of boring. So let's look at uh, one of his more um, uh, complicated paintings. This is a work that's called The uh, Surrender at Breda. Uh, the, the Spanish over the course of about a hundred years, because they were so powerful, were constantly at war with various nations. 
uh, and everyone had their eyes on the Dutch. The Dutch were incredibly rich. They were, you know, kings of the uh, of trade routes and so forth, and they didn't have a very powerful standing army. So one after another European nation either tried to marry into that wealth or conquer that wealth. And the Spain actually controlled large areas of Flanders and Holland on and off through the 16th century. It, it didn't actually end until the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, in any case, what you're witnessing here is a work from the mid 1630s, 1631, 32 or so, um, called The Surrender of Breda, which is a, a pseudo documentary of an actual event in which the Spanish beat the Dutch one more time. Now, within about 10 years, the Spanish will be driven out of Holland again. Uh, but in this case, what we're witnessing is the end of a major conflict, which you see in the background in which um, at the end of this, the, the leader, the general of the Dutch army, and we know all these people's names, you don't need to remember them, but this is Justin of Nassau, a very important general, is handing over the keys of the city, literally, to Ambrosio Spinola, the major general of the Spanish. And it's seen as if it is a gentlemanly affair, right? Spinola kind of reaches over and pats him on the shoulder and says, good fight, you know, uh, maybe you'll get us next time or something like that. And, and Justin is just handing over those keys like he's fine with the whole situation. Now, of course, these types of scenes uh, are painted this way according to, um, you know, to the side that wins own uh, thoughts on the subject. So if this were a scene painted by the Dutch, I'm sure it would be quite different than the scene painted by the Spanish. But with that being said, there are a whole host of things that are in here that are meant to show you why the Spanish win and why the Dutch lose. Um, if you look at the difference between the Spanish side, and by the way, these are all portraits of important people in this battle that can all be identified. You see that they have all these pikes, these spears up in the air, and they're all very regimented. They're all in a row, and there are a lot of them, uh, with only a few kind of tipping sideways to add a little bit of dramatic motion to it. That's to give you the idea that the Spanish are a regimented, strong, powerful army. Whereas if you look over here, these battle axes or halberds of the Dutch are all, there's just a couple of them, and they're all, you know, kind of off axis, off to the side. Also, over on the Spanish side, very prominently displayed is the horse that Ambrosio has just jumped off. That's remember that symbolism goes way back to the idea of the great general or the great leader being able to lead his horse the same way that he leads his army. Whereas over here, there is a horse, but he's way in the background and he's not so closely associated with Justin. But the big thing is, look at the Dutch. They don't even have uniforms. They don't have armor. I'm not sure what this guy's doing, but it, it looks like he's looking at his finger like he's got a little boo-boo on his finger and he's worried about it. They're a ragtag bunch of militia. They're not the regimented army of the Spanish, so of course they couldn't possibly win this. And again, it comes from the painting is done to make the Spanish look great, to make the Dutch look inferior, and to make this whole thing seem like it was just a big sporting event event uh, in which the Dutch are plenty happy to have lost and, and to turn over the keys of the city to the Spanish. Alaska is unlike Spanish painters where it was kind of forbidden for them to represent female nudes because he became so popular uh, actually represented female nudes quite frequently. Um, this is a work that is called um, well, it, it, it's it's called the Venus figure, the Rokeby Venus, but Rokeby doesn't mean anything. That's just the name of one of the early um, owners of this work. Again, not much to say about this. This is Diego Velasquez emulating the style of Titian. You can probably see that the, the outline of this figure is very, very soft. It's built up out of layers of glazes meant to appeal to our senses. So we've got Venus on her side, um, very beautifully represented. All the areas that are seen as erogenous, this incredible swell of the hips, which was very hot at the time, the deep counter curve of the body, all of that being emphasized here while she looks at herself in a mirror held by Cupid. This is a Vanitas picture, right? That's the cover story for why you get to represent a female nude. 
It's supposed to be saying on the surface that don't get too caught up in your beauty. You know, you still have heaven to worry about. But on the other hand, people are only buying these things because they're so beautiful and erotic. Velasquez's most important painting is this one, which is in the Prado in Madrid. It's a, a work that is usually known as Las Meninas, or the Maid Servants. It is an incredibly complex group portrait as well as a self-portrait. And what I mean by this is that um, on the one hand, what we are seeing is the young princess Infanta Margarita. She's the daughter of uh, Philip IV. Um, with her ladies in waiting, her maids of honor on both sides of her, um, attending to her. So it's a portrait of her, and then it's also a self-portrait of Diego Velasquez here, who is apparently painting a giant uh, canvas here in front of us and has just stopped to pause and look out at us in the midst of this. Now, group portraits, and you're probably aware of this, can be incredibly boring works of art or photographs in our own contemporary world. I don't know the number of times I've had to you know, sit for a group portrait, either a family portrait or a sports portrait. And it's always the same. Tall people in the back, short people in the front, everyone crowd in, make sure we can get you all into the frame. So during the Baroque period, a lot of artists try to toy around with the boringness of group portraits to make them more interesting. And this is one of the most interesting ones you can imagine. Because what we're actually seeing is Diego Velasquez you can probably see this here. Right in the middle, there is what looks like a painting, but it's actually a mirror. And that mirror shows us what's in our space, looking back at Diego Velasquez, and it's the king and the queen. So what he's doing is he's supposedly painting the king and the queen here. And this canvas, by the way, is exactly the same scale as the canvas itself of the entire picture. This is bizarre, right? This canvas, in other words, its scale, and these, this picture is about life size, it's about the same size as this scale of the entire picture. Velasquez is painting the king and the queen, while at the same time he's painting himself in this scene, painting as well the scene in which it exists, which is the Infanta Margarita and her ma uh, maid servants. Other kind of incidentals in here, off to the side there's a dwarf or a little person, um, these were oftentimes play uh, play dates of the the you know the the uh, the princesses and another little girl here and the dog in the foreground. In the background here is a uh, a nun who is probably her teacher as well as a scholar here who is her male teacher. The the interesting other anecdotes of this is the room in which this is actually painted is the artist's own studio in the, the castle of Alcazar. Um, and this room was actually given to the painter after a young prince had died. It's a way for Velasquez to say, the king and the queen think that I'm so important that they'll come to my studio for a portrait which they probably wouldn't have. He actually thought of himself as part of the family. In fact, on his coat here, there is a uh, insignia of the Knights of Santiago. He was knighted uh, later on in his career uh, and probably came back to this painting and painted this on his, uh, on his breast. The close up on the right hand side of this of the mirror scene of the king and the queen watching as the infant kind of gets ready for her own portrait and showing Diego painting that whole scene. And I also wanted to point out, um, some of you take the class next quarter, Art 128, and want to know where abstraction came from. There were plenty of precedents for abstraction in the Baroque period. This is a close-up, if we go back here, of this part of the maid's uh, wrist. It looks very realistic from far away, but when you get up to it, you can see it's dashes of paint surface. We're gonna move on briefly to Flanders uh, and round out our, uh, our lecture for today with Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens was uh, the most prolific painter of the Baroque period. 
he at one point in his career and by the way he he started he entered the guild of amsterdam at the age of 25 he got a rich patron who sent him all around europe uh, basically painting all the great works of art that he found for him uh and this this then introduced peter paul rubens to every famous work of art out there and then went on to paint big huge incredibly uh, dramatic scenes such as this this is about uh, almost two and a half times life size it's a work that's called the raising of the cross which is in the biggest cathedral in uh, amsterdam in any case peter paul rubens um, at one point in his career was the court painter for three different major um, nations. He was the court painter for Philip IV for a bit. He was a court painter for Mary de' Medici, who was the queen regent in France. And he was the court painter for Charles IV in England at the same time. And he oftentimes even carried um, diplomatic kind of missives between these different people. In any case, um, the raising of the cross, I'm just going to go over briefly. Um, hopefully you can tell just by looking at this that it couldn't possibly be a Renaissance or classical work of art. It's It hovers in between the naturalism of Caravaggio and the idealism of a Baroque, or I'm sorry, a, a classical work of art uh, in that, you know, the body is incredibly, of Christ, is incredibly muscle built and so forth. But some of the figures off to the side here below the Virgin Mary and John the Evangelist, way off to the, the left-hand side or the right-hand side of Christ are incredibly naturalistically represented. The other big thing though, that is that it's just immensely dramatic, isn't it? Everything's set up on a diagonal. There's all this kind of, you know, swirling uh, light of the different musculature of the bodies. Everything's in motion. Uh, there's a lot of anguish on various people's faces. Uh, everything about this is supposed to be high drama. Some more of these so that you can see some of his religious works right off, and then I will be spending a lot of time with a series of works that he did for Mary de' Medici. This is a painting that is called The Descent from the Cross. Uh, we've seen a lot of these scenes before. It's Christ being taken down off of the cross. We could identify every single one of these characters. Hopefully you can do this by now. Uh, the youngest of these and given a very prominent position is John the Evangelist. Uh, Virgin Mary is in blue over here. She's actually being shielded from this, this horrible scene by the rich guy in the story who is Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Nicodemus is over here on the ladder, and then down at his feet, who is this, crying at his feet? Mary Magdalene again. So, yeah, I could go on and on about this, but the big thing I wanted to point out is that the entire composition, instead of being a giant pyramidal form, is set up as a big X, right? We go up through these eyes, up the body of Christ, up his arm to this figure, or up this figure, down through the axis of Christ, through John the Evangelist's body, down his leg, and to the bottom of the the um, the ladder here. So a big X gives you the dramatic and emotive quality of diagonals, but also creates a fairly stable composition by interlocking these diagonals. vast majority of my time I want to spend on this work. It's one of a series of over 30 paintings that Peter Paul Rubens did for Mary de' Medici. If that name sounds familiar, it's because, yes, she comes from the Medici family of Florence, although we've pushed forward in time quite a bit. So let's start with that story. Um, Mary de' Medici was married off to Henry IV of France, who is the father of Louis the Thirteenth? Who is the king who presides over all of those movies about the three and the four musketeers? That's the time period that we're dealing with here. Uh, eventually, Henry the Fourth is actually going to be assassinated. But in this story, he is married to Mary de Medici um, in an arranged marriage because France has been locked in endless warfare and they don't have very much money left, and the French aristocrats are getting pretty grumpy about this. The, the French aristocrats 
are constantly embattled with the king. They don't like to be in wars because unless they go quick, they're constantly having to raise armies and pay taxes, and the people that they are ruling over don't like them very much. And 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 that's all a part of the story, by the way. When Mary de Medici gets married into the 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 monarchy of France is because the Medici family wants to gain a foothold in the French monarchy. And they send her to Henry IV with 600,000 gold coins, gold ducats, which are very, very expensive coins. Last time I looked this up, this is uh, about $50 million by contemporary standards. So huge dowry paid to get into this position. So she marries Henry IV, um, and, uh, you know, they, they have children. Louis the 13th is going to be the king. But Henry the fourth is assassinated when Louis the 13th is about eight years old. So Mary de Medici becomes the queen regent. She rules for, um, this young king until he comes of age. Now, as she is being queen regent, of course, many other members of the French aristocracy, as well as famously um, this cardinal of France, Car Cardinal Ricciolia, decide to try to get her out of the way. And the way they do this is that they're, they convince the young king that she's, she's power hungry and that if he just gets rid of his mom, banishes her from court, um, they will, uh, he'll be able to do whatever he wants. And sh so he does. He banishes mom from court. And then five years later, when she is allowed back into the French aristocracy, she goes to Peter Paul Rubens and commissions 30 paintings from him. And these are giant paintings, by the way, to show the French aristocracy and the people of France all the things that she contributed to France. So what you're seeing here is not the very first, but one of the first of these paintings called Henry IV Receiving the Portrait of Mary de Medici. And what we see here is Henry IV looking at the portrait of Mary de Medici and falling immediately into love. The picture is down below. We see something you saw before in the Botticelli work. You have a couple of putti or little cherub figures playing around with armor. What this is meant to say is it's the triumph of love over war again. Henry, who's still dressed in all his armor, is now smitten with his new promised young bride, and he's going to give up on warfare. It's a way of Mary de Medici saying to the court of France, remember, I was the one who got Henry to stop warring with everyone and how much that benefited you. Over his shoulder is a personification of France. And the reason we know that is you may be able to see this, and if not, just look it up. On her dress all over the place are these little fleur-de-lis. They're a kind of stylized lily that is a symbol of particular houses of France. But she also, besides being a personification of France, looks suspiciously like Minerva or Athena with her helm here. And remember, Athena is the goddess of warfare, but she's also the goddess of wisdom. And she's saying, you know, dude, give up on war. Let's uh, let's devote ourselves to your young bride here. The two figures who are holding the portrait are on the one hand, Cupid, the god of love. And over here is the Greek god of marriage, whose name appropriately is Hymen, believe it or not. And then up above, you see Z Jupiter and Juno, or as they're known in Greek times, Zeus and Hera. And they're identifiable because Zeus is next to his eagle and Hera is next to her peacocks, who are witnessing this whole scene. They're the divine couple, the beautiful divine couple up above witnessing the scene. But more than that, they're symbolic of something really important here that will go on to be a key component of Mary de Medici's um, contribution to French culture. The Medici family, of course, famously funded the much of the Italian Renaissance, and they were the ones who really brought classicism back into art. This is Mary de Medici's way of saying, my family were the ones who you know, made important culture and painting and arts and uh, the Greek classics. And, and that's how she does it. Just very briefly, 
16, you see it's of the same series, Mary de Medici landing in Marseille. Marseille is a, a port town in the south of France. And in this scene, again, all of France embraces her with open arms. This personification of France again with the fleur-de-lis here embraces her. She's so important that Poseidon and his sea nymphs have escorted her across the Mediterranean to this port, uh, you know, town in the south of France. This is, again, another way for Rubens to show uh, that Mary de Medici wants the French people to realize she and her family brought art to Italy and they'll bring it to France as well, which the French aristocrats care quite a bit about. Now, often I'll also pause on this because many people point out, you know, the very fleshy, voluptuous figures that are in Rubens' works. They don't look anything like a Botticelli work. They're very voluptuous. They've got a lot of flesh on their bones. And people can't understand, I think, that at this time period, that was considered really, really hot. Um, that the stick figure, very athletic, beautiful bodies that are around today were not always the norm that beauty was oftentimes seen quite differently in the earlier ages. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture for this week. Uh, we'll get together again next week and uh, finish out this quarter with Baroque arts in, um, in Holland and in France.